Trepidation's a pretty good word for it, I guess. Um, daunting. Um, how the heck are we going to do these? Eleven has just taken it to a whole new level, really. I mean, the stories, the complexity of the ideas. This felt like we were going into completely new territory, but holding on to all the essentials. Series 10 would have probably been classed as foreplay. 11 and 12 was a full-blown orgy. There were some production problems last series, uh, and UK TV thought it would be a good idea for us to find a production company to work alongside GMP. To cut a long story short, we then couldn't go through Grand Naylor, so we had to find another production company. The actual place I always wanted to go to was Baby Cow, and I said that to UK TV right from the beginning, and I didn't particularly know Henry at that point, but I did know Kerry. Actually, the first time I met Kerry was we were doing Son of Cliché in we a radio show in the Latchmere Theatre, and she was stage manager of that, so that was the first time we met. And then when the show moved from Manchester down to Shepparton, I think Series 4 was the first one she worked on, did 4, 5 and 6. And I'm so glad that Doug came to Baby Cow because I knew Henry was a fan and he was very excited about the whole prospect of doing any more Red Dwarf. It's like a match made in heaven. The support, the team that they brought in, it's really allowed Doug to just kind of relax and focus on the writing, the director, the creative side of it and not have to worry so much about the organisation and management. It's been difficult to actually express to people who've asked me just how good the storylines are in, in 11 and 12. Everyone's going, how on earth are we going to do that? You know, given the schedule, given maybe financial constraints. Please for coffee? Uh, me, please. Thanks, Keith. The budget only go to one couple. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the imagination and the sheer scale of trying to realise that imagination has been... It's been nice being part of it, I suppose. <laughs> the bitch is back! <laughs> <laughs> In my heart, I looked at it all and thought, I think I should start and go back to the beginning and uh, copy it from the beginning, because that's what's really stuck in everyone's head. I was uh, a little bit apprehensive about, well, no, I'll, I'll call a spade a spade uh, as ever. I, I didn't want to wear a wig, frankly, but, um, you know, nature calls for something to be done up with the barnet, uh, or lack of it. So we went down the route of, of a wig, but I think in series 11 and 12, Vanessa's wig was probably the best. I mean, it was absolutely superb. <laughs> We had the taken back 28 years. And you know, it wasn't that difficult. We just had to get the wig right. And obviously when he started, it was his own hair. And then as the show progressed, they seemed to wig him. So as his wig progressed, for some reason they used a form of, well, a Caucasian hair for his wig. So it made him look more like he was going to go and join some sort of romantic part in a film, rather than what Danny looked like to start with. So that was my big bugbear, that I was going to make his hair look like what it would have done before. Danny had quite a strong viewpoint of how he wanted to look. He wanted his shading. I think it's because he's done Cats the musical, because I think there's a little bit of that memory in it. So he liked his eyebrows to be drawn on, and he's got his eyeliner, and he's got his cheekbones in. They wanted it to be as simple, but look as good as possible. And when I researched it, at the beginning, of the, they, all, they used what was called a latex mask, and that is just, it's just rubber. You can breathe in it. Basically, they pulled it over, sealed it under his eyes, and it must have been horrible. So I actually work with a company called Millennium FX, 
we get people scanned all the time, but never for prosthetic makeup as detailed as that. So it was a big risk for us to uh, to just make sure everything was was absolutely perfect and spot on. We took a lot of measurements and caliper measurements, and when the 3D data came back to us, we did the same digitally. We needed to make sure that there was no wavering of information, just because we didn't want something like a spinal tap thing where it sort of comes two millimeters big instead of uh, you know his own head size. What happened was I went to this studio, sat on a chair like this. There were 97 cameras all around me on posts, sat there like that. They had a thing to rest my head against, sit still, go like that, and it went choom! A huge advantage of that, which I didn't think of, is when you have the mould done, just the weight of the stuff tends to sort of do that. So that's what, the, you always look like this knackered old thing. As the years went on, the mask was quite pointed and pinched and long-nosed, and we wanted to make him look friendly and cosy. So, without changing it too much. So it was sculpted to resemble more the original mark. I think it looks better, it felt much better, it fitted much better, it, and I was able to be much more animated. You know, in the old days, I'd get Crichton to go like that. I'd be going like that underneath. So it was a sort of form of puppetry. Whereas there was, I could tell, once I saw back a few clips, I went, oh, right, I don't need to go so crazy, because that's that comes through the mask much more. I could sort of turn it down a bit. Doug doesn't really like to make easy episodes, so he thought the first day would be a really nice 25 rimmers in one room day. They were a nice kind of welcome everyone. Let's do a load of split screen stuff. You just think, why can't you ease us in, you know, nicely? A couple of nice scenes, you know, like one-to-ones, you know, a bash and a bash, you know, you know, find our characters again sort of thing, but no, straight into the deep end. Yeah. Um when the cast came in, they went, oh, this is such a hard day to do. Oh, my God, this is going to be terrible. In fact, it's a really easy day for them to do because they've got hardly any dialogue. It's a hard day for the flipping director who's got to sit and work out what all each of the 36 rimmers are doing and saying to one another. I had my script, you know, pages for the first day shoot, blah, 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 going over it in the car on the way there, blah, 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 which I, must look quite odd if people see me driving, <laughs> oh, 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 I'm doing my Crichton lines. Get there, meet the makeup people, oh, it's all exciting, there's the new costumes, oh my God, every, see everybody I hadn't seen for a long time. Get in the makeup chair, makeup on, boom, new makeup, oh, it's different, ah, blah, 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 glue, 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 glue. Two and a half hours, three hours, I think I was in makeup. Then the new costume. Oh, it's really comfy, Howard. Ah, oh, blah, blah, blah. I'll measure it. Oh, I can take that in. I'll let that out, put that out there. Get in the boots. <laughs> okay, right, let's get on the set. Okay, walked all the way across Pinewood to the set. And literally, as I walked onto the set, I heard Matt, our wonderful floor manager, shouted, and ladies and gentlemen, that's a wrap. Thank you very much. And they'd finished. <laughs> so I did nothing. <laughs> <laughs> so that was my day one. We then drove down to Forley, which is near Southampton, to an old power station that's been decommissioned. And I drove down with Dan and uh, Craig. And there was a great moment when we stopped off at motorway services to get a cup of coffee. And the three of us were standing in line at the Starbucks. <laughs> and a woman came up to us and just said, are you real? That was what she said. Are you real? And her husband was standing behind her going, oh, no. So he was so embarrassed. <laughs> the dream place to film, especially for science fiction, and they obviously film Rollerball there and Mission Impossible, and the staff and everyone there is so friendly. It's just one of those places you could film there for three weeks. There's every little corner has got something amazingly run down and dystopian and grungy. The control room that we filmed in, this was like a giant stingray set. Buttons and levers and desks and, you know, production values just rise when you get on a set like that. Forley has got all the ducts and the pipes and the stairs and the height and the generators. And of course, you know, control consoles. That was what really got me. And it's one of these places where time really looks if it stood still. So uh, I loved all that. Yeah. I mean, it's really quite weird because it is a quite 1960s vision of the future. The future's concrete. No, 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 no need to be frightened. There was a time I was a teensy, tiny, teeny, weeny bit mad, <laughs> but not anymore. Asclepius is stunning and so unique and wonderful and colourful and dark at the same time. 
There isn't a robot like it, I don't think. The sort of lovely kind of candy colours. You can make something that's lovely and sweet seem incredibly sinister and dark um, when it's brought to set and lit in a certain way, performed in a certain way, and then dealt with in a certain way by the story and by the direction. So really the fact that it's coming across as quite dark is really a credit to the production team and to, to Doug. You look at Snacky and the way we got to know him and the way he came along anyway was such sort of sweet and innocent as machines go. But the contrast was Asclepius. That was one of the scariest creations I think Red Dwarfs ever had. So you had a great contrast between those two. People with Asclepius, they say, oh, this is genuinely scary. You think, God, it would be so easy to make a horror movie if, uh, <laughs> if that's the case. But I think it's the idea. Anyone who body naps organs, I mean, you know, that's not good, is it? Let's be honest. Take a seat in the waiting room. I'll First position. First position. A lot of snack dispensing in Doug's world. He just wants to live in a world where there's just endless snacks being dispensed everywhere. Because <laughs> he could have been a kind of polishing robot, but no, he's a snack dispenser. When it was in the development stage, Snacky was too good, and I wanted something cruder and more 1960s sci-fi. So you had this thing of, oh my God, this is supposed to be this amazing machine, but in fact, it's a snack dispenser. And in fact, in the end, I got Nick Affey, the storyboard artist, to draw it to my instructions, said, can you do that? Can you stick an egg flipper, blah, 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 and he did it. That's the, the version that they then copied and, and we made. <laughs> No, it's actually much more comfortable than probably anything I've ever been in before, so, yeah, it's good. This way. <laughs> Snacky um, is naturally um, quite an introvert. Despite his knowing it, he actually is capable of working with stasis boots. So, <laughs> he's a sort of natural overachiever, maybe. The episode is a heartening story of how a humble snack machine can turn out to be the saviour of the day. It's easy to sort of to gloss over how a character like Snacky comes together. It's a great piece of physical work by Toby, plus the, the Mark voiceover, so brilliant performance. Yeah. We rushed forwards with lights and smoke in this incredibly elaborate set in this amazing power station. We just see snacking. It was just the sort of juxtaposition, if you like, of, of this amazingly well lit the shot was, and then Snacky just keeling over. It was just <laughs> hilarious. This poor Toby, who was a bit shaken up, manages to climb out of the suit, only for Danny John Jules to go, There's a little man in there. So, having filmed with Snacky for three days, Danny didn't even realise there was a bloke in, in Snacky. So that's just Danny for you, in a world of his own. He dedicated to the character, I think, because he doesn't even realise that there are men in, you know, in outfits. Okay, you've lost it. Do you face two when you see it? You have to. Let's get this audience ramped up. Before any studio audience night recording, there is going to be a certain amount of nerves. I think we are all nervous. I don't really get nervous, to be honest. I'm not saying that's a good or a bad thing. It's just a case of, I mean, we've been doing it for so long. First time in front of a studio audience for five years-ish, there were a lot of sweaty bottoms around. <laughs> I 
It was the first episode we recorded in front of an audience, which was both terrifying and uplifting, uh, uh, often at the same time. It appears to be some sort of research facility where top scientists specialised in recycling space junk and turning it into something useful. You'd better be on your toes, then. <laughs> I know, sir, the most important part of the scene, too. I didn't remember any lines, but I did lean. But yeah, now the first week was a bit nerve wracking. I mean, you know, when you've done 28 years, when you've done 10 series, uh, the legacy is, is that much more important to, to preserve the quality and it, it gets harder and harder and it becomes more and more important, hence much more pressure each time. We're like a family and we've become, no one really moans at one another, they accept one another's flaws and don't really say anything. And it kind of works and it's really interesting. We struggled a little bit originally trying to find a studio because everywhere is booked up now by these massive movies. But then when Pinewood's TV studios were available, we booked them. And it was a bit smaller than the Shepperton case stage. It was a quarter of the size smaller, which meant we had to reduce the audience a bit and we had to do some kind of clever shuffling of getting sets in and out. So it was a bit of a, a mind-numbing, low-nutting exercise just to fit what we wanted to fit into the studio because those kind of studios really are built for three, four set sitcoms, old panel shows, not for things which want to be more ambitious. Julian, I have to say, did a great job. We took the bunk room over. The idea was given to us that this set existed completely and we didn't need to worry about it. In reality, that wasn't really the case because it didn't fit to our new set and it had been stored and it had all got a bit damp and everything had warped and fallen off and withered. So we rebuilt more than half of it. So we had to build entirely new sleeping quarters out of the budget, which meant that was we had to you know, make cutbacks in different areas to, to cover that, which was frustrating. But in the end, a great set. I think it's a, a measure of my irredeemable soul that I want to live there. I actually want that to be my man cave. I think I might phone up and go, guys, come down to my house, turn my games room into the sleeping quarters. That'd be so cool, wouldn't it? Because we have very, very small amount of space on the studio. It's very tight and we're in a, a stage that's nearly 40% smaller than it was last year with the same amount of scenery to fit in. So the whole set has got compressed in and any bit of the set we can redress, we do redress. So. We've currently got the Medi Bay redressed as a 1920s nightclub. We've had the sleeping quarters redressed as cat sleeping quarters. We put lifts in and out of those two sets as well. So we have a, you know, we've got a tiny audience, 250 people, and just those sets really. So everything has to sort of fit into that area. We wanted a more techie, larger area. The sort of bridge set that we had last time was too narrow and it, it made it look like some kind of kids TV show with everyone facing out front. And so I wanted a big science room, you know, with a medi bay and good monitors with, with, that were done on both sides with blinky lights and the whole thing in depth to it. It's a generic room where anything can happen really. It's got a sort of examination couch if they're ill, which we managed to get off another film. They've got some control desks. It just gives them somewhere to do things, to do tech. I know I could have lost my script that quickly. Yeah. It was written quite late on in series 11, and we watched Rosemary's Baby. Just the idea of Cat being pregnant and having this sort of mutant inside him, and all of a sudden Doug kind of unlocked that comedy premise that he needs. And that was an episode where, on a bit of card, it was, what can we do with the cat being a virgin? You can't possibly just lose his virginity in a conventional way. There's going to be some terrible, <laughs> terrible penalty. Yes, sir, the particular tribe that inhabit that belt are the Nakininkas, the vampire gelfs to you and me. Vampire gelfs? Mm, the story goes they feast on the blood of virgins. Someone mentioned virgin. That was it. From opening scene, it could only go downhill from there for the cat. It is a little moment that Rimmer does have oh, over the cat. Okay. Let's just kill that right he now. He is positively Hugh Hefner compared to the cat. Birds, Matt, pleased to see you. 
love working with Danny because I'm playing a cat and my character has to seduce him. I've had to learn to copy some of his mannerisms and the way he is um, as a cat, which has been really fun, just kind of watching him and then like, copying bits that he's, that he's doing. So hopefully it looks good, my, my mirroring of him, and not like a bad impression. That's not what I want to um, <laughs> do. <laughs> to have to perform probably one of the most, well, the most famous cat scene, the original entrance into the show, that's man, this is man, da 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 You know, that would have been a, a, a pretty daunting task to anyone, and she pulled it off uh, seamlessly. I think it was on one of the last days we ever shot it, and then clearly the production crew by then had been working with us for a long time, they'd put up with a lot, and they suddenly had massive buckets of sticky, cold gunge with yellow and green and horrible bits in it, which they enjoyed enormously covering us with. Yeah, that's looking good. Oh! We just let them. We let them do it. It gave them pleasure. If it made them happy, it was worth it. <laughs> Anything but price mm -hmm. Craig Shredlock's got the best agent of anyone. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> anyone else? Has my, dreads, my dreads have been on the phone all morning. Speaking <laughs> of, <laughs> if everything in the universe is going to end, including time itself, what's the point in cleaning above eye level? Reading this script, I took a little bit of personal offence. I thought, wait a minute, what's going on here? You know, this is this uh, feels a bit personal. It's about a character having a midlife crisis. Doug has always, you know, picked from our real lives and our real characters. And I think that's a wise thing to do on a long running show. I think if you're having a midlife crisis at their age or even my age, you're doing really, really well. We've all experienced something along those lines where something, you know, you kind of do something and you go, that is a bit tragic for a man my age, you know, I really must try and grow up. For just a guy having a midlife crisis, that's not very interesting. But I thought, oh, it's, it's interesting if Crichton has a midlife crisis. And I thought, should we address the age thing? Is that interesting? I'm not sure. I love the idea of the universe also having a midlife crisis. I was prepared to alter the age of the universe to make that idea work. It was one of my, my favourite episodes of the 12. To see Robert in his sort of supersonic Ferrari red souped up outfit and doing all that sort of charging around the set, he was absolutely in his element. The script touched on the, the essential futility of human existence. I thought, I think very well. And, and then, and, then it, and to such a degree, because then a mechanoid goes, well, yeah, humans, they, their, their existence is a bit futile. But then when they realise their own existence is futile as well, that's when Crichton really bit the dust and had to get on a groovy new suit. So that moment, which was the first time for many years where we did a scene where the audience laughed for so long and for so hard that we literally just had to stand and wait. And, so, and there, there's no way that they could ever run that in the actual end TV version because it was just too long, you know, it just went on and on and on. And plus, with a new pull rod suspension system allowing my nose to be lower to the ground, I can take corners at 38 degrees. Check this. Whoa! 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 I skidded then, sir. <laughs> Off the page, I mean, it read very well, but when Dominic Coleman came in, it was absolutely superb, his performance. I was just chuckling all the way through the week. When I was approached to do this, it was like a, a Crichton alike. So I kind of thought, oh, OK, and very much approached it from that, of trying to just to put a different spin on what he does. I've worn prosthetics before, but you can always... Well, usually you can recognise yourself in them. Your features stay the same, and, but this is very different. This is a full sort of headpiece. It's quite different. It took a lot of getting used to, actually, and trying to rediscover your performance, if that makes sense. I've got away with it very lightly, really, compared to Bobby. That's quite a tough thing to do to keep it going for that amount of time. I did wake up this morning and just thought, oh, no, I've got to put that thing back on, you know? Prepare yourself to die, human ship of scum. <laughs> Equa Hecate, is that you? <laughs> Butler? 
Göre kuk swag morak. Rock the edge. Tigong not for me now. The costume really, of course, it lends itself to the character because it's so. I mean, it was so visually part of who he was. So whereas before, obviously, in the audition and the and the rehearsals and things, it was all about the voice. The very first voice I I tried. Practicing at home, I did. I did in the audition, and then they kind of obviously liked it, and I used it. It was this kind of uh, slightly kind of Slavic accent, and really like gross, uh, guttural, and deep, which was based on kind of clips I'd seen before of, of the Gelf cheese. So yeah, I, I guess I kind of combined the two when it came to doing it today. So it was tried to use the the amazing claws I had, the shape of him, and the size of him, and stuff like that. And I happened to find a fantastic, what was a gorilla outfit, but I was thinking if I could use the gorilla outfit top and then I would be able to make him into a bit more of a something that the Gelf was like, a bit piggy and a bit monkeyish. The face of the Gelf chief I actually got over from New York. It was a ready-made piece. It looked like a monkey, but by the time you add some extra lumps and bumps and you, you just try and disguise things. So if you buy something off the shelf, you try and make it look individual. And I think we actually succeeded on that. Good hair for a girl. He's a great hair for a girl, isn't he? So this is a conditioner, clearly. Volumizer. Volumizer. It has to be up there amongst the top one or top two scenes throughout the whole of of the uh, the twelve episodes. Was the scene where we we have Butler with us in Starbug, and the all I can say is the sort of. <laughs> I mean, we were all all of us were cracking up when he did that. You know, it's like, I am Equahecte, and then he go, oh, Equahecte, how are you? Oh, Equahecte, all that sort of stuff. That was, we were just killing ourselves with laughter uh, all through the week at that. Robert plays it superbly, actually. Uh, it's um, just that. <laughs> you can see that uh, Crichton really wants to smash Butler's face in, really. <laughs> I actually remember being, like, actually upset. <laughs> Because Crichton's always been able to speak Gelf, no one's ever questioned it. Suddenly he's been corrected by Buckler. Go, be gone, go. Ah, plus, like that, liga beans, clack. They'll turn up. S I O. What's that? The search for an intelligent universe. We got to talk to the universe, um, as you do. What a piece of casting you get presented with in that situation. Who could be the voice? of the universe. Well, we were absolutely fortunate throughout all 12 episodes to have a young actor called Daniel Barker. I am the universe. I am everything. I have been doing a couple of voices for various uh, characters. The main ones have been the, the voice of the, the ship's lift and the universe, which is a kind of Morgan Freeman impression. I did send them a few like, examples, like a Brian Blessed thing or a, uh, you know, kind of big bumbling slow godlike voice but they wanted a kind of Morgan Freeman style nice and slow and so I had to do that on the set make sure it sounded nice but I don't know how it sounded how it sounded at the time but we'll see you know and the lift was just a kind of jobs worthy type like that you know going up and down the shaft I'm going to take you on the ride of your life now just hang on no you hang on Hello, is there anyone there? Yes, I am here. When you're filming it, it's just like looking up at, uh, at some marks and you've all got the same eye line and you're totally encased in green. And you do wonder what the art department and the special effects department are going to make it look like. The actors were having to imagine a lot of what they were going to be looking at. And also at the time, nobody knew what the actual set was going to look like. It was uh, a few weeks later where we found something that we thought would be suitable. Because to, to build bespoke spaceships all the way through, that's the sort of budget for a feature film. It made more sense that we would look for existing spaceships and adjust them and adapt them. We then take that into Maya and we give it sort of a once over. Then from that we'll retexture it to try and get the textures up to the quality that we want. And if necessary, adapt the model. I mean, the SIU model. Um, he used to have a city in the middle of the dome. We took that out and replaced it with a gangplank. We changed the whole scale of, of that. Rim, 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 this father shock cortex is singing for you. That's entertainment. Perfect example of that. You shouldn't give some people power. That was one of the first scripts I read when I was sent the scripts beforehand. 
and it was just brilliant right from the start it started to make me laugh you know right from the third or fourth line on page one the captain we meet who's been printed to save the ship with his head round the wrong way when you read it you go that's a funny idea but you don't expect to actually see it you know i've met the actor a few times but i hadn't seen him in makeup it's that same thing he walks on the set and there's a human being with a mouth there but the his face the rest of his face is looking at the ceiling <laughs> It's the most freaky, the poor guy, because he had to open a little hatch in his neck <laughs> to be able to see where he was. He's basically a bio-printed captain of a spaceship, but the angle on it is, is that he's a kind of Brill Cream Boy, RAF, Biggles, sort of tally-ho chaps, bandits at four o'clock, you know, that sort of thing. Scramble, damn this gammy leg. And then, because he'd got this tash as well, that they'd done sort of RAF, Biggles, he sort of twirly tash. So then I approach you from, from the voice, really. I go, well, this is how the guy's going to be. He's going to be swaggery. He's going to be 1941, very kind of front foot, very, very in charge. He brought a real sort of gravitas and the officer class irritation to it, which I thought was great. A new officer's club, sir. <sighs> Chris and I have talked about that a lot, about particularly, bizarrely, with the television work we've done outside Red Dwarf, We've been in officers' messes, Chris far more than me, and he comes from an army family. But that stance, I've witnessed that stance in real life by a man who's not trying to be funny. <laughs> but it, it did give me my opportunity to do my officers' mess stance, which I remember as a child seeing in various officers' messes around Germany and England, where these chaps are standing in a sort of exaggerated 10 to 2 stance. So it was great fun to do all that. So it was a very accurate portrayal. So how are you getting on today? Had a good day? Marvellous. I didn't see the, the finished thing until today when I came in. I mean, because you just see the back of it, they pull off the back, so you just see the, the inside of the mask. So you don't actually see what it looks like until it's on. We changed it so much and it was sort of, it's going to be half up and half down. And eventually Doug just said, what if his head was on top of his head? What if his face on top of his head? And we were just sat in the design room here and we just went bloop and it just it was just the funniest thing in a way that made it much more economical to build because you know if there's an eye halfway up the head and the, the, the audience can see it if it's not moving and animating you'll feel a little awkward about it and it won't feel natural we were up in millennium having various expressions uh, of my face cast for the rimmer monster you pull a, a sort of face a sort of a or a you know, had to hold that for quite a long time. It's actually quite a difficult thing to do. There were some, obviously, concerns about the Rimmer monster. What would that look like? Would that just be, like, hideously bad? But Richard pointed out, you know, even if it is a bit crap, it would still be funny. So we, we felt protected. And what you've got to do is make sure you don't do it CG because that could just take you completely out of the story. We built little stick men to indicate all the different performers and then just bent them into a shape around Chris. I think it was vital for us that Chris was comfortable because it's not his day-to-day -day thing to you know, get into big rubber costumes and you know, we wanted to make sure that he felt that he could perform as well as possible. Uh, extraordinary Rimmer monster was very definitely an artistic first. To actually be in it and be part of it was probably one of the most uncomfortable experiences of my life. It was me sitting in the middle of this sort of trolley with someone behind me controlling a, a, a Rimmer head. There was someone sort of lying under me, I think, controlling a, a Rimmer head. And then other Rimmers sort of sewn into this giant blue Rimmer costume. It sort of crawled down the corridors <laughs> and went in various places. Uh, it's, it could only just fit. I'm just going to say, it makes a change from carrying the rest of the cast. <laughs> <laughs> but it's lit so well that it is genuinely frightening when we were filming it, you know, and the faces and stuff like that. This monster made up of all the darknesses of a cornered, an angry, a rimmer gone mad, a rampant rimmer. It becomes actually quite a sort of sinister thing, really, just, you know, beyond uh, daft old rimmer getting it wrong all the time. It, it, it's taken on a much more kind of sinister character, if you like. Sir, there's no cause for alarm. We are under no danger as long as we don't do anything vindictive, selfish, or unethical. Right, we're in big trouble. Sir, you just have to be nice to me. Big, big trouble. 
Samsara was the cheap show to make up for 20 Curran's Officer Rimmer. It started out life called Lift Off, and it was basically everyone trapped in two separate lifts. And so it's a bit like Maroon, but different. With the idea that we have this karma drive thing that's backfired and is controlling what's happening. And both Richard and Andrew said, you're wasting that idea, you should really go for it. And I went, but this is my cheap show, it's holding two lifts. And they went, no, just go for it. This is a state-of-the-art research ship with self-repairing engine parts. Crashing shouldn't be, should be impossible. Starts off with us playing Monopoly. <laughs> That's a great board game. And of course we had loaded dice to do this, which didn't work. We were there for hours trying to make these things go. OK, I accept it. Just lucky for you, I'm such a good loser. So if ever you're thinking of buying loaded dice, make them good quality. <laughs> I think these were loaded dice bought on a budget. I didn't expect the dice to work. I'm not stupid. So I bought another set of dice from eBay. And I think the dice I bought were the same dice that Julian had bought and neither worked. If you bought them and went, you know, to a casino thinking that you're going to earn yourself a fortune, you'd go home without a shirt on your back. <laughs> oh, I thought, great, I'm going to get to eat an ice cream in my bunk now. And because ice cream melts under hot lights, the ice cream was mashed potato, right, and then covered with a little bit of that whippy foam thing on top of that. Mm, it's lovely, it's like... You won't eat the prop, that's <laughs> You're dead, but you're still talking for... <laughs> Professor Parker reporting for duty. Welcome to Professor. My colleague, Okay. We met the professor. Thank you. We were both Pretty exciting. Sir, and it's just last year, if you recall. Ah, that's not so close, sir. Because it's uh, a flashback show, never had a scene with the uh, guest cast. It's just one of those shows where you wonder what's happening on the other side of the fence. So, you know, you just have to make sure that you get your gags right, you know, and um, have the confidence to know that it's going to happen on the other end. That people are thinking all the time about what's the best, the best way to film and the best uh, gag, and, yeah, it's, it's great, it's a lovely atmosphere. He's a sort of very weak-willed adulterer, and it turns out in the end that, that uh, Maggie's character, Rachel Barker, is, is the strong one, and he just sort of goes to pieces slowly. And it's quite fun to just sort of start as a slightly pompous space colonel and then end up as just this sort of, oh, oh, oh leave me alone, I'm just, oh, we're gonna, oh, maybe, oh, all right, yeah. just basically anything to have uh, space nucky. I originally auditioned for the role of Jim, and uh, I didn't get it, but they said if I wanted to do the role of Smith, which only had one line, I said, you know, it's Red Dwarf, would love to. <laughs> I must get on, we'll catch up later, Jim. Yeah. They remind me. And the funny thing is, uh, the rewrite happened later in the week, and I ended up becoming the captain of the ship. So, yeah, I was quite happy with that. <laughs> because everyone's so damn happy, because everyone loves gravy, right? They gave him this special hat to wear at night. So one of the funniest scenes uh, of series 11, uh, and that was the Archimedes scene with Cat and Lister, which was absolutely hilarious. For that moment, I could just watch this madness and Danny's insanity. <laughs> Not Danny. Well, yeah, let's be honest. Danny's insanity wearing Craig down. So it was Cat's insanity wearing Lister down so he's just a broken man in the corner hearing. To be honest, it's one of the funniest scenes in the whole nearly 30 years of, of, of uh, doing Red Dwarf. There's a scene with me and Danny. He's got every historical fact wrong. He's got the names wrong, the professions wrong, but he's telling the story with such conviction. I wrote that scene in bed on my iPhone one night, about five to midnight, and I was really laughing. Um, <laughs> this is, yeah, blah, blah. And it, it, it did change a bit, but the, the basic idea of Archimedes and the whole bath and thing and blah, 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 was was all written there. Let me ask you a question. How does a bath fall out of the street? The thing about doing it in front of a live audience is you don't need reviews. You've got, like, people just laughing their, their guts and you just think, wow, this is really working. It's times like that when the best comedy comes out because you've got a bit of fear in there. And I think anybody that is going into comedy and there's not that bit of fear, I 
I think that you rest on your laurels and you, you, you know, you just walk through it. There's no walking through that scene. You're on the edge of your seat and the, the, your balls are already in the vice and it's turning as you speak. We wanted to have Starbuck in Red Dwarf 10. That was the plan originally, but then sort of time and money constraints meant that we couldn't, couldn't have it or couldn't do it properly. So Doug took the decision early when writing the scripts that the three main standing sets were going to be the sleeping quarters, the science room, and then Starbuck. And Starbuck looked fantastic. I mean, it completely changed uh, the design, which is not so good when, um, when you're struggling with your lines and, you know, we had screens before and we could just stick them on there and stuff like that. Whereas now we have this sloping away desk like that and, you know, so it's like... But, I mean, there was loads of bells and whistles and lights and, you know, things to play with. That's my favourite bit of acting, you know. You know, when you're starting pressing buttons and all that and, and pretending that you're, you're flying a spaceship. The seating arrangements were the same. The shape of the, the cockpit and everything was slightly different, but once we're back in there doing the Starbug scenes, we were happy, you know. And they do have a special feeling all the Starbug scenes. It's a great set as well because um, you kind of glue to your positions and so they're really dialogue heavy, you know. If you can get the dialogue moving fast. It hadn't been seen for a couple of series and we had to try and recreate something that the fans would recognise as Starbug but was a new Starbug. A lot of what we were referencing was the show back in the sort of 90s, 80s and 90s which was slightly old tech and we've got bits of old aircraft seat from the 1970s in there. Well, I thought I'd make it with an extra wall and we've used that a lot now. We've had the extra wall in for all the shots through from the front you see both sides of the ship. And yeah, we did some good, good crash stuff in this series I think, you know. Starbug always crashes and never gets damaged. <laughs> That is great little rotating wire model. We put that on the little monitor screen at the back of Starbug. Slightly retro graphics, it's kind of where we're at with most stuff really. We try and make everything not futuristic, but not old fashioned. It's a hard line to tread really, retro future. Well, originally it started out as something of a just excuse to learn Blender, open source 3D modeling software. And then that expanded out into, let's make some shiny videos for Dimension Jump, the convention. It's more of a design thing to make the whole experience a bit more immersive for the fans. We made loads of screens that were based on the original screens in the show. The videos that we did for the convention, which were this and a few others, there were Raspberry Pis that had vaguely randomised playlists. You know, a really nice condensed physical package that you can hide behind a television or in any sort of nook and cranny. And what I like about doing that kind of stuff is you get to put in little in jobs like the first recording date of Red Dwarf and that kind of thing is all in there as like part of the, the OS. Richard saw it and quite liked it and Doug saw it and quite liked it and we get contacted and say, can we have these? Right. Let's do this. Mike Tucker set up a company called The Model Unit who have supplied things to show in the past. They kindly offered to make the bazookoids for us for the original design and the original mould, which I think they created. I'd built the bazookoids back for Series 6, the short-barrelled versions, and the moulds for those still existed. In discussions then with Julian and with Doug Naylor, it became clear that what they actually wanted was the long-barrelled versions seen um, in season three. And so we came up with a hybrid, which is here. So the back end from their back is what was used on series six. And then Nick Cool, who was working with me on these, rebuilt the barrel section um, much more along the style of the original Series 3 ones. So what you end up with is a prop that's fibreglass and ABS tubing, that's lightweight, is Craig-proof, hopefully, for it to feel as though it fits back into that classic dwarf universe. I myself was very pleasantly surprised when I saw that we had real live working scutters. It's taken them 28 years to, to get to that point, of course. It was really good to, to have them back performing so well. Tell all lifts we're interviewing for a new position in shaft 14. All applicants must be prepared to travel, only lifts need apply. They, they worked rather well and they were very articulate. <laughs> Bob the Scutter. Bob and Madge. I always wanted to enter one of them in robot wars and watch it get battered. <laughs> and they haven't been used for, I don't know how many years, quite a long time. 
and they were in a dreadful state. One had been completely cannibalised and turned into a pull along on a wire model. We sent them off to Paul Fulton, our special effects guy, who spent quite a few weeks on them and completely rebuilt them. But he said it was like going back in history. There were bits of you know old stuff from the 80s. Radio control technology has come a long way since then, so we completely revamped them, put new controllers in them, and... I felt, you know, out of Kerry, out of respect, I should probably let her operate. I think I would have done a better job, if I'm honest. I had remote control cars as a kid, and no, she wasn't having any of it. And if you know, I think it took about six or seven takes to really, you know, get it right, but, you know, we, we let her have her moment, and, you know, we learned from then on. She didn't operate it again after that. Action! <laughs> I don't think Richard got a look in, actually. <laughs> I don't think there was any question about who was going to operate a scutter. It would obviously be the person with the most experience. And we go way back, me and those scutters. They were my old friends. I was very glad to see them, actually. Yeah, Richard was very convinced that he would be much better than anyone else. Standing commanding senior premier officer here. Why do you never ask me? Maybe I've got a theory. Maybe I've got a really great theory. But you're always too busy asking him to find out how great my theory really is. Okay. Any theories, remember? None at this point. It's the principle. No one actually went on in there. More or less, eh? Hello, speakeasy for scientists to talk about science. <laughs> Just a brilliant idea. And instead of it being, so, we, so you're allowed to gamble and drink, but you just couldn't do science, you know. Just a brilliant twist on the whole thing and the, the whole kind of anti-science movement that occasionally pops up with certain barking mad religious groups. It was all about a technology ban and sort of trying to, I don't know, hold back technology, which, strangely enough, I'm actually quite for this sort of thing. I'm not for holding back technology. I, I, I you know, I've got a sat nav, you know, I've, I've got a mobile phone, a basic mobile phone, albeit. But I think sometimes technology can go too fast and, and we, you know, it can almost sort of ruin a human being. This was different, this show, in that we did have an extra day filming with this, with the biggest set I think we've ever had on Red Dwarf built inside the studio. It was movie time. So by then we'd been working in the studio quite a bit and there's the one side is where the audience are and maybe a little bit of a set around the side and the other side is the main set that we normally use and suddenly you go into the studio and there is a long street with cobbles on the floor and snow and shop windows full of food and clothes and things and, and, then, and street lamps and then there's a Model T Ford and there's another old car there and you just go, this is Red Dwarf. So we were going to go and do it on location in a town centre and then they decided and then we would build it in our slightly too small studio. So we've managed to squeeze 28 metres of vintage street and dress it with cobbles and snow, uh, including having a couple of 1920s cars in there driving up and down. that set so unlike anything you'd expect to see on Red Dwarf you know with flight of stairs coming down to this speakeasy bar with the, with the woman de Lundwy, who is played by Rebecca who had been in series 10 playing pre. It was noticeably bigger this time like everything was bigger the sets seemed bigger a lot more props certainly. <laughs> There was some interesting body language that we had to react to, and I didn't have to act. Who was I flirting with? The lady never tells. It's a raid! <laughs> Find something to do! Don't look suspicious! And, and Lucy Pohl uh, plays the scientist uh, doing some science in this speakeasy, and um, she's got the most complicated dialogue I've ever heard anyone say, way more complicated than Roberts. Just absolutely fantastic. Newer lines from the beginning and just did it bang, bang, bang every time. Well, every guy likes particles that turn into waves, right? Or maybe you're more in the mood for some Copenhagen interpretation. 
You know what I'm talking about. Where subatomic events are only perceptible as indeterministic, physically discontinuous transitions between discrete and stationary states. That one line um, about the subatomic events, the Copenhagen interpretation line, took me about four hours to learn just that line. And I had to actually go and look up what it actually meant to be able to memorize it and um, and understand it. Otherwise, I couldn't I couldn't say it without knowing what it actually was. But it was a lot of fun, and I, I learned a lot. I can't say the line. I couldn't say the line even. I couldn't even read the line. Never mind say it. Obviously, before we got there, we'd already met some interesting characters. Four of twenty-seven, played by a superb actor, Kevin Eldon. I am four of twenty-seven. Actually, Kevin wasn't very well that day. He'd had the flu, I think, and so we had to be quite careful. But I mean, he's so good. He just came in, nailed it. And Kevin would change his punchline every time just to, to wind the audience up. Do you come here often? <laughs> do you do kissing? We didn't do the last scene in Twentico because it was nearly Christmas at that point and I felt it was unfair to overrun. And it didn't really make that much difference, the fact that we didn't shoot it. It was a really easy scene to pick up. Us humans have really got to be on our toes. Make sure we don't lose ourselves and allow technology to take over. I'll make a note and remind you if you're ever in danger, sir. Arms? Final scene, which is really one of my favourite scenes that we've, we did in the whole series, is, is Crichton showing very clearly that that the machines are in control and that the human race can't function without them. We didn't have time to shoot that when we were shooting Twentica because we ran out of time. So we had to pick that up the following year. I mean, it's bonkers, but that was really what happened. ourselves and let technology take over. I'll make a note, sir, and be sure to warn you should I see you're in any danger of that. Arms? Yeah, you do that. Looking after Lister is like looking after a three-year-old. Take your socky off. Put it here, that's it, put it in the washing basket, you know, it's all those things. When we came back after the Christmas bake, um, Series 12 is a different set than Series 11. The sleeping quarters have been rejigged and revamped and stuff like that. So, the last scene of Series 11 is shot on the set of Series 12. Now, did you notice that? Did you? Did you really? Dun, dun, dun. Dun, 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 dun. <laughs>